Welcome back to Bible study. I would like to start with prayer and then go to it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for the possibility we have to deepen our understanding, expand our knowledge. And we pray that through the Holy Spirit, you will bless us as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Before going to the specific study we are going to have this morning, I would like to just uh, take the overall picture of the chapters we have already seen together. We started with Genesis chapter 1. That's the first creation account. It describes the 6 plus 1, 7 days of creation, with the Sabbath being the culmination of creation. Then in Genesis chapter 2, we had the second creation account, which we saw expands on the first account, but it is also part of the fall story because the fall story is written in a chiastic structure. There's a before and an after of the fall. So you have described life as it was before the fall and then in chapter 3, life as it became after the fall. Chapter 4 introduces the genealogies that come from Adam. And in chapter 4, we have uh, the dispute between Cain and Abel. Abel is killed, Cain survives, but we see that his genealogy is rebellious against God, and uh, he will not prosper. But God intervenes at the end of chapter 4, and God gives another son to Adam and Eve. And that son is the one that brings the genealogy of the Messiah that will fulfill the first prophecy about the coming of a Messiah in Genesis 3.15. So in the genealogy of Seth, because that's the name of the God-given son, we see how the line of the Messiah goes all the way down to Noah. Noah finds grace in God's eyes, and when the whole world becomes corrupt, and God decides to destroy that world, God speaks to Noah, and Noah builds the ark. There's a very small number of people that is saved and then from those people we again have three genealogies and from the three genealogies there is one the genealogy of Shem the Semites those that will carry on the line of the Messiah and in that genealogy, we reach the story of Abraham. Very interesting and intriguing story. What I would like to see together this morning is that, again, there is a specific way the writer of this story builds the story. So it's not just a story with some episode written in a chronological order or in just a random way. It is a well-thought, well-constructed story which points somewhere. And I think this morning we'll have the possibility to look at the real way uh, scholars or those that do in-depth study try to see that point, that focal point where a construction called chiasm or ch 
chiastic structure points. So go to Genesis chapter 11, the end of chapter 11, and the story of Abraham goes from chapter 11, the final part, all the way to chapter 25. So it's a pretty long story. What you can notice, and that is a very interesting thing, is the story in chapter 11 starts with Abram, so his name is still Abram, getting married. Who's his wife? Sarai, still not Sarah. Right? Because at one point, we will have a name change for both. So Abram marries Sarai. Nothing special about that. We've seen other people getting married. But when it comes to a narrative, when it comes to a story, it's very interesting when a story starts with a marriage and ends with a marriage. What does it suggest? If a story ends pretty much the same way as it starts. Because now you know the Bible is written in a Hebraic mindset. So when you have a story that starts pretty much the same way. Here Abraham marries Sarai. And here Abraham remarries after Sarai's death, and takes a new wife called Keturah. From a Bible study perspective, that's a pretty potent sign that you may have some sort of a parallelism between those two stories. And then the question is, okay, so if Abraham's story starts with a marriage and ends with a marriage, is that an indication, a hint, that we have a chiastic structure? Well, look at some other details in those two points. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 32, Terah, who's Terah? That's Abraham's father. He dies. In the story of Abraham remarrying or taking Keturah in marriage, Abraham dies. Parallel ideas. Then Sarai is barren in the first story here. Keturah, on the other end, is not barren. So there's a contrast between the two wives of Abraham. Abraham and his family journey west in chapter 11, 31. In chapter 25, verse 6, Abraham's family journeys east. So let me tell you some of the specifics of this. When you have a chiasm in a story, you are looking for people, the characters, see what the characters do. You're looking for events, see if there is any connection between events. You are looking for words that somehow mirror one another, either being uh, synonymous or contrasting. You are looking to see if there is any kind of direction because sometimes the chiasm is moving in one direction and then moving away from that direction. Just like here, you have journey west and then you have journey east. So all of those things can be pointers that indeed you have a chiasm here, a chiastic structure. Let's go one step further. If you look at chapter 12, the first section of chapter 12, it is when God speaks to Abraham and tells him to move out from his place, from his family, from his kindred. 
It's interesting that the same word, moledet, that is translated with kindred or family in chapter 12, verse 1, is repeated in 24, verse 4 and 7. Same word, moledet. It's a very strong indication that you have a parallel structure here. Okay? Then look at the fact that in chapter 12, from the very beginning, God speaks to Abraham and he says, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." What is the strongest idea that emerges here? Abraham will be blessed. And it's repeated again and again. Okay, jump to 24. 24, that's the parallel section. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord did what? had blessed Abraham in all things. Look at verse 7. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying, to your descendants I give this land. Chapter 12 verse 7 is pretty much the same as chapter 24 Verse 7. So, is it obvious that we have blessings in both sections? Absolutely. What's even more interesting is that in chapter 12, Abraham is called to move away from his family and kindred. And then in chapter 24, Abraham calls one of his servants and sends him back to his family and kindred. Again, you have directions. Moving away, then moving back. Again, a sign that you are having a structure here. Point C in your worksheet. Sarai and foreigners. And then, on the other end, Sarah, because now the name is changed already, and foreigners. In the first story, Abraham receives gifts from Pharaoh when uh, he moves down to Egypt because of the famine in the land. And down in Egypt, he lies about the relationship between him and his wife Sarai. The Pharaoh wants Sarai for himself. Then he finds out, hey, these guys are married. So to cover everything, he gives Abraham gifts. In similar language, in the parallel section in chapter 23, Abraham acquires properties from the Hittites. This time, he acquires a property to be able to bury Sarah. So, there's a connection there about getting some goods. Point D. Abraham and Lot separate, and then a blessing is pronounced. On the other side, the story of Isaac's redemption, and again a blessing is pronounced. You may say, well, there's no direct parallel between those two stories. Where well, there is in the language. Because if you look at... Uh, Chapter 13, verses 10 and 14, Lot lifts his eyes. And there's a specific sentence in the Hebrew. Lot lifts his eyes. And then God commands Abram in verse 14 to lift his eyes. There's this lift your eyes thing. 
in the parallel section, verse 4 and also 13 in chapter 22, Abraham lifts his eyes. Again, there is a specific movement that indicates, hey, there is some parallelism in between these sections. Then you move to point E. Rescuing Lot and dealing with foreign kings. And on the other side, wells and again dealing with foreign kings. This dealing with foreign kings clearly appears in both sections. But what's interesting is armies or an army commander is in view on one side and the other. Then wells, there's a word for wells. Wells in chapter 14 verse 10 is translated in some translations into English with pits. But in Hebrew is the same word, well, pit. Well on one side, well on the other side. And in both stories, there's a covenant. And the covenant involves animals in both stories. In Abraham's covenant with God is the story when Abraham has to cut those animals, put them on one side and the other, and then God will pass through them. In the other story, in chapter 21, Abraham and Pichol, the commander of the army of Abimelech, they get into a covenant and animals are gifted by Abraham to the king. Point F. There's a first exodus of Hagar and Ishmael when they run away from home. In the parallel passage on the other side, there's a second exodus of Hagar and Ishmael. The parallelism is pretty clear. You have a woman, Hagar, and the child run away from home first. In the second story, same woman, same child. They are not running away. This time they are sent away from home. But there's again the same kind of movement. Point G, birth of Isaac is promised in chapter 17 and 18. Then in the parallel section, birth of Isaac happens. So first he's promised, then it happens. And it's interesting that there is a story about circumcision in both sections. In the first section, Ishmael is circumcised, who's the first biological son of Abraham, right? In the second story, Isaac is circumcised, who is the second biological son of Abraham, but in reality, he's the inheritant of the blessings that will carry on the line of the Messiah. Okay. Then a very interesting section, section H, where in both sections, before and after the climax, you have a question, and I would like to read that question. Chapter 18 first, verse 23 and Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? You know, this is part of the Sodom and Gomorrah story. When Abraham intercedes for the cities. And Abraham says, Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, jump to chapter... 20 and look at verse 4. But Abimelech had not come near her, that is Sarah, and he said, Lord, it's Abimelech speaking with God, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? The language is clearly parallel. It's about the same concept. 
Okay, so if you are going to intervene, are you going to destroy the righteous along with the wicked? In the same section, there's a godless place on one side, and there's a godless place on the other side. On one side, it is Sodom and Gomorrah. On the other side, is the kingdom of King Abimelech. And a very interesting word is used on both sides. 18 verse 17, chapter 18 verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? The word is, shall I cover? That's the Hebrew. Shall I cover? It's the same concept, but it's more vivid in the Hebrew. It's a covering. Shall I cover something from my servant Abraham? And then when you go to 20, verse 16, Behold, I have given you, your brother, a thousand pieces of silver. This is Abimelech speaking to Sarah about Abraham. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. The word translated into English is vindicate. But the Hebrew is not vindicate. It's not um, an abstract concept of vindication. It's cover. Indeed, this covers you. I mean, under this cover, let's forget the whole story. That's the point. Okay? So you have, again, the usage of those words. Now you may think, oh, this is so abstract, so dry, so, so useless and senseless. Well, you may be right in a sense. But when you do in-depth study, and I just did this demonstration for the sake of you understanding how people, how Bible scholars discover these chiastic structures. Because when you look at your paper, doesn't it look neat the way it's constructed? It does look neat. But look at where it's going. Chapter 19, verse 29. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham. God remembered Abraham. Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. Huh, that's interesting. God remembered Abraham. Have you seen that before? Where? Genesis chapter 8, first verse. What does it say? Then God did what? Remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. Interesting. Can you see the parallelism now? And if you think I just made this up, let me show I'm not making it up. Because if you look at the story in Genesis 19, it's obvious that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah parallels the story of the flood. How? Look at verse 16. And while he lingered, that is Lot, the man took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. Go back to chapter 8. Actually, chapter 6, verse 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Lot, lo the Lord was merciful to him. Can you see the connection? And in verse 19, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight and you have increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life. But there's another 
interesting element. Do you remember when Noah came out of the ark? First, he built an altar, brought an offering, a sacrifice to the Lord. Very spiritual moment. And then what? He, he drank. And he became drunk to the point where he didn't know what he was doing. Okay. Look at verse 32 in chapter 19. The daughters of Lot are speaking among themselves. Come, let us make our father do what? Drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Huh, interesting. And if you read on the story, you will see that he became drunk to the point where he had sexual intercourse with his daughters and he had no idea what he did. Can you see the parallelism? It's obvious. The language shows you that. But then you will ask, okay, so what? Did you hear Jesus speak about the end of history? Saying that the end will be like in the days of whom? Uh, Noah. Okay. Good enough. But then have you heard Jesus also say that the end will be like in the days of? Of Lot. Oh, interesting. If you read Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21, it will immediately bring it to you. Oh, wow. These two stories, the stories in which we have highlighted in the center of that chiasm, both in the case of Noah and in the case of Lot, there's a concept very important, not only for those stories, but also for the story of the end. And what's that concept? God remembered. Oh, interesting. And if you look at Genesis chapter 9, when God gives that token of the covenant, of the Noatic covenant, chapter 9, verse 15. And I will remember my covenant. Again, and because there you have a little chiasm that describes the story of how God gave this token of his grace and of his remembrance called rainbow. And God remembered. And that's the essence of the gospel. Because in the story of Noah and the flood, and in the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, you have the foreshadow, the preview, if you want, of the end. And for you and for me, it is crucial to see that at the zenith, so to speak, of the end time events, you have the same exact message. Michael will stand up. Why? Because God remembered. That's my presentation. It's your turn. Very good question. Is every book of the Bible written in a chiasm? Does every book contain chiasms? I could not say a very strong yes, but I can surely say most of them. Not only that, the five books of Moses are written in a chiasm. And do you know where the center of the five books of Moses is? Where you have the description of Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement, which is practically the highest point of the sanctuary service on earth as 
pre-viewing or foreshadowing Jesus' high priestly activity in the heavenly sanctuary. But yes, you have it in the Old Testament very pregnantly. I wouldn't say everywhere. That's why you have to study the text and see if you can see a chiasm. Next time we will see that within a chiasm, there can be another chiasm, because for instance here, there is another smaller chiasm like this here, where the name change happens, but that's next time. So the question is, you have Genesis 3.15, which is right in the fall story. Is that like the focal point of God's promises of where the entire gospel goes? Can we say that all we see in the Bible, it's like the devil fighting against God's plan to bring about the promise? And I think yes. And that's why throughout the history of the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, you can see the forces of evil hitting on all sides, but God marches on and, and brings on the next phase of uh, the fulfillment of the promise. And it happens then first in Jesus Christ, in his uh, sacrifice at the cross, and then the final fulfillment, the culmination of it, at the second coming, and then even within the second coming, you have that final moment after the thousand years when everything is reestablished to the pre-fall or Edenic condition. Yes. Where did Noah find wine? Good question. We spoke about this that the first 11 chapters of the Bible is not a few days. It's hundreds of years, thousands. Meaning that you have a very compact history. So we should not think that Noah built an altar yesterday and he did that beautiful spiritual service to the Lord. And then the following day he drank and uh, he failed lamentably. So that's not the picture. Of course, when you tell a long story short, you can get that impression. But it's not hard to imagine that, yes, Noah and his family came out of the ark. They started their own little life. It wasn't easy at the beginning. But little by little, the nature around them started to come back to more normal shape and form. And uh, they planted a vine, right, a plant. And then uh, they ate grapes. And they pressed grapes. And they left the pressed grape juice in the sun. And you can try and you will see how it works. <laughs> Does fermentation represent sin? Yes. Fermentation as sin in the Bible appears most vividly in the Nisan 14 celebration, which is uh, the Passover or the Pesach celebration. The celebration in which the Jews had to remove all leaven or fermentation from their houses. Meaning that even the leaven that is used for bread, because you know there is that thing that they put in the flour that they will then uh, knead, um, that's fermented. So yes, and later on Jesus uses it as an illustration uh, watch out, stay away from uh, the leaven or the fermentation of the Pharisees, that hypocritical kind of attitude. Then the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 has an indirect hint reminding us that we should be clean, we should be 
totally dedicated to God and avoid leaven, meaning eliminate sin from our lives. Yes, thank you. Was Sarah a half sister of Abraham? If yes, then was Abraham's lie really a lie? Good question. It's obvious that she was. It's not very clear in the first story when Abraham has to deal with Pharaoh in Egypt. But in the second story with Abimelech, it's interesting how he didn't learn his lesson. He, he had the problem in Egypt and then he kept on with the same strategy. This Abraham wasn't as brave as we thought he was. Right? Yes, he was brave enough to pack up everything. He was a wealthy man. He had people around him. He had servants. He was brave enough to pack up and go where God wanted him to go. But then you can see how he was human as well. In Egypt, he said what he said about Sarah so he can save his own skin. In the kingdom of uh, King Abimelech, same thing. And in that story with Abimelech, he clearly says she is from the same father, but not from the same mother. So in technical terms, you may challenge the idea that he lied. But then when uh, you see how uh, things evolve, it's pretty obvious that telling the truth should have been or could have been the better option in that situation. But your question raises a much bigger question, especially in the context of the Old Testament. Is lying or not telling the truth or not telling the complete truth a sin. And I know we can get in very difficult, controversial conversation on this. But what I can underline very clearly is that the commandment from the Decalogue, I know it would be very easy to simplify and uh, pull a blanket on all those things and say, the Ten Commandments says, in the Ninth Commandment, do not lie. But that's not what the commandment says. The commandment says, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Meaning, somebody is in court with somebody else. Or in that context, somebody has taken somebody else in front of the judges, maybe to the gate of the city. And they say, okay, who has witnesses? Because you have this divergence here, you have this uh, fight over something. We need two or three witnesses. And then somebody comes to you and tells you, brother, I'm uh, between a rock and a hard place. I would need a witness. Would you please help me? But what happened? Well, this happened, but, you know, I need you to say this. And you go and bear false witness against your brother. That's the context of that commandment. Do not bear false witness. It's a legal term against your brother. So that is clearly and very strongly, very firmly disapproved, forbidden by the Decalogue. But then the question is, is every lie of that nature? The Bible also says uh, our yes should be yes, our no should be no. We should be truthful people. We should speak the truth. But then are there situations where telling the truth or giving the truth in the hands of somebody's enemy could become a lethal weapon in that person's hand? 
Okay, we have this conflict with this war, indeed, in Ukraine right now. You know the number one target of the Russians in this whole thing seems to be the president of Ukraine. He even said in a conversation yesterday with the European leaders, guys, this might be the last time you see me alive. That's horrible. Say at one point he has to, has to flee and hide. And somebody hides his family. And the enemy comes and smells the smell of the president around your house and asks where the president is. Are you going to give that lethal weapon in the hands of the enemy? Are you lying or not? If not. So what I'm trying to point out, things are not that easy. It can be really complicated. So let's stay with the Bible. The Bible says do not bear false witness against your neighbor. There's a good movie, The, the Miserables, Les Miserables. And there's a final segment there toward the end of the movie where the priest, the Catholic priest, receives the convict that escaped into his house. And guess what? The convict, during the night when everybody sleeps, gets up, steals some um, valuable objects from the house, and leaves. The police catches him and uh, brings him back to the priest. When the priest sees what is happening, he says, no, sir, I gave them to him. Is he lying now? He is. Did he give them? He did not. He stole them. What he was doing is qualified by God as a lie or not? I don't know. But Do you know what is behind that story? Well, behind that story is that in France at that time, when uh, Victor Hugo wrote the Troubles, there was a very strong reaction against clergy. Victor Hugo writes this novel to point out that even among clergy people, there are good people. Not everybody is corrupt. So, so, so that, that's the irony. So the writer writes the story to point out how those that are considered to be all corrupt are not all corrupt using an element that you can easily sense as being corrupt because his positive features or his positive nature as a character is underlined exactly by this lie he tells the police when they want to get the convict and arrest him again. Very complicated life. Okay, so that's a very specific question. The question is not whether we should drink wine or not. The question in First Timothy is whether you can take wine for your stomach problems, and if yes, what kind of wine that was. Since something is recommended by somebody, doctor or not, because the Apostle Paul was not a physician, he was more like a theologian with a wide knowledge in many things, If he recommended something as a cure to a sickness, then most obviously we have to deal here with some sort of a medicine, homemade medicine. Now, what exactly that was, we don't know. It's the same word, oinos, wine, that can be used for alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverage. But we know that even today, there are some extracts, plant extracts, that are done with alcohol. So we have that today as well. Obviously, the context there is um, 
medical purposes. I pastored in a context, in a specific cultural context, where people were coming to the Lord and getting converted, giving up wine and beer, but then they found a medical kind of alcohol used as medicine by some people. But my folks would buy entire bottles <laughs> and uh, drink instead of beer or wine. So I tried to approach them and they said, Pastor, if you just knew how sick we are. <laughs> so what I'm trying to point out is if somebody wants to drink, he or she will find all kinds of arguments to do that. I have a pretty strong New Testament passage that says, do not become drunk of wine or inebriated by wine because that is debauchery, but be full of the Holy Spirit. And that's a word play there because you have the Holy Spirit and the spiritum, uh, spiritum that is in alcohol. So then the question is, if you are full of Holy Spirit, can you allow some other spirit as well competing in your little bottle, which is your body? It's very hard not to see that in the Old Testament you had strong men of faith that drank alcohol. Noah is one of them. Lot, Lot was not a faithless human being. He drank. When you go to the story of Jacob, and we'll go there, he drank to the point where he married a woman and he realized it was the other woman <laughs> next morning. How's that? But all of that is no argument for you <laughs> to drink. Somebody's failure or the fact that God presents reality as it is should not be an argument strong enough for you to keep failing. Be sober and watch. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the great questions. It's so good to be able to deepen our observation of your realities. And we pray that you will continue to stir us through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.